Hello and welcome to Marketing Monday. We're so excited you're here. We're even more excited to talk about Dexter Cattle today during Cattle Month. So get excited. Woohoo! Yeah. Woo <laughs> we have some awesome special guests here today that we're so excited to welcome. So welcome Kimberly and Jeff. Thanks for joining us today. And you Thank are with us. Yes, absolutely. And y'all are with the American Dexter Cattle Association. So that's awesome. Do you all want to introduce yourselves real quick and let us know a little bit about yourselves? Yes, uh, I'm uh, Jeff Chambers uh, with the American Dexter Cattle Association, the pre uh, recently elected president just two days ago or one day ago. Congratulations. Um, had Dexter cattle for almost 21 years and loved them. Yep. I'm Kimberly Jepson, and I've been on the Dexter Cattle Association board as the vice president for two years. And as of Saturday, I have voluntarily stepped down and had a wonderful new lady take my place. So I'm super excited to see what she does. And um, I've had cattle, Dexter cattle, since 2015. Wow. Awesome. Wow. Well, I'm Brittany Sweeney, and I'm the communications manager of the Livestock Conservancy. And also with us here today is Pork Ride. He loves pigs and cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's> awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, let's get started. So, again, my name is Ryan Kierton. I am the Breed Association Manager for the Livestock Conservancy. And um, I, I've been really excited to get to talk to you two. Uh, just seeing the work that you guys are doing and just like, man. They, they definitely deserve a spot on the highly coveted Marketing Monday. And uh, I'm just super honored that I've been able to get you guys on here. So, uh, you know, fun fact about me, uh, when I used to live in Texas, uh, I managed uh, a couple different livestock herds. And one of them actually was Dexter cows on top of a uh, Charlotte cattle. And so being able to kind of like have this loop around of like, yeah, I've raised them, market them. And now I got like pros and experts who will talk about this breed. <laughs> Um, that was so fascinating and intricate by. So yeah, let's get started. So I, I, I guess the important thing is understanding the uniqueness of the Dexter cattle. So really quickly, talk about what makes Dexter's fairly unique compared to, let's say, your, your Angus or any other type of cattle breed. Well, um, I'll take the first shot at this, Kimberly. Um, so Dexter's, as you know, uh, you go by pork or rind? <laughs> Usually uh, pork rind. No, pork rind. Okay. Or. Um, as, as, as you know, um, Dexter cattle are, are unique in, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, one, they are one of the few uh, dual purpose breeds still left in the United States. Um, many of the other breeds of cattle have chosen to focus on either beef or dairy and with those, there are some others, but Dexter's are by far perhaps the most common um, uh, rare or niche breed that is still focused on uh, dual purpose traits. So that's one very unique characteristic of our cattle. And some people would even say tri-purpose. Uh, there are still some folks out there that are using Dexter for oxen. Uh, and um, so, and they do very well as oxen as well from what I've heard. Uh, another unique characteristic of our Dexter cattle is of course their size. Uh, the size of Dexter cattle are, are uh, you know, 40, 44 inches uh, maximum is, is kind of the guideline for what we'd like to see in bulls, 42 inches for cows. Um, so those that's substantially smaller than many other breeds in terms of their height. Um, and then um, uh, uh, the, the temperament of Dexter cattle is widely known as, as one of their selling points as well. Uh, Dexter cattle, I don't know if it's it's from their nature as being a dual purpose homestead cow or not, but they are incredibly friendly. They seek human interaction uh, and they thrive with it. Uh, so those are three of the most unique, from my perspective, characteristics of Dexter cattle. Um, besides the absolutely delicious and top quality beef and dairy you can get from both. Um, so Kimberly, I don't know if you have anything to add to that or not. Yeah, actually I do. You know, and this is not scientifically proven. So it's just my experience with Dexter's. Um, we had originally started with Dexter's because my husband was actually allergic to dairy and had been diagnosed as a kid and had said hit long term health issues regarding it. And so um, we sought raw milk and that sort of thing. But 
he grew up on on drinking raw milk and he just couldn't tolerate it any longer. Um, so I I had read about you know A2 and all that and thought, well, I'm going to get myself some some Dexter cows because they're small and everything that Jeff said. And I got two, one was A2 milk and the other one was just A1. And I'll make a very long story short, I ended up milking both of them and did a whole series of like experiments with my husband. And he was able to drink both of them, um, both of the, the types of milk. So then it got me curious, what is it about Dexter's that are unique to other types of breeds? I sought out a dairy farm that had Guernseys and Holsteins, which have amazing uh, or not Guernseys, it was Guernseys and Jerseys and have amazing cream lines and that milk is rich and creamy and delicious, but it was grass fed and A2 and he still couldn't drink it. And when we did a panel of the three, it, he could drink the Dexter milk, but he couldn't drink any other raw milk. So it, it seemed odd. And then I opened a dairy, a very small um, dairy farm on selling just Dexter milk. And most of my customers come to me because they can't drink other cow's milk, but they can drink our Dexter milk. And since five years ago, we made this discovery. I, I breed for whatever I like in confirmation and quality and temperament. And I no longer test for that, uh, for A2 proteins, because to us, it doesn't matter. Um, recently, I was out of milk um, because of our breeding season. So... Um, I had a farmer friend I was sending all of my customers to that was selling milk, raw milk. And they all came back and said, I can't drink it. And one that was I thought was most interesting is he's on dialysis and he um, he gets there's a pro or a, I forget what it's called, potassium that builds up, especially if you drink too much milk. And you can't process that out. And even dialysis can't. And if it builds up, it can kill you. And the doctor said, stay off of all dairy products. And so he came to me and he can drink our Dexter milk. And for the for last year, his levels have stayed lower, even with the milk. So without milk, they were higher, which is, again, it's not scientifically proven, but this has been his experience. And then after getting the Dexter milk, it lowered a little bit and maintained and then he started drinking my friend's milk and his levels shot through the roof and he had to stop drinking it again. So I don't know what it is exactly. And I think though we should do some further investigation into this, but it is something that is noteworthy that more people can tolerate their milk. Um, if you have any sensitivities or allergies or, or whatnot to dairy, Dexter milk is very, very digestible and easily tolerated. Yeah, and Kimberly, just to add on to that, not to forget the beef side because we're a dual purpose breed. Yes. The, the and 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 both I know Kimberly and I both focus on dual purpose a lot. Yeah. Um, is that um, just in 2019, uh, the grass finished Dexter beef won the American Royal uh, most most uh, was it most tender most flavorful might have yeah. been called it, uh, contest at the American Royal. Um, and, you know, Dexter beef, we, we, again, we need to do no more study and understand this better, but it is known for being incredibly tender. Uh, some people say it's the size of the muscle fibers. I don't know that if that's the factor or not. Uh, it marbles incredibly well, both in grass finish programs and grain finish programs. Um, and the cutout efficiencies are just tremendous from what we're seeing from folks that grow both for their own home, but then also for uh, 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 farm to plate type operations, which are springing up more and more across the country, specifically with Dexter cattle. Yeah, I will add that I'm in the middle of cattle, I mean, not cattle country, because, you know, that's Jeff's territory, but um, I have, I literally am in rural Oklahoma, surrounded by beef cattle, and um, I have people that come to my farm for the milk, and I've also, they also see the, the beef, and they see the grass fed beef signs everywhere. And I'll, I'll get these guys that have their cattle that they're just to get a thing of milk. And they're like, how do you get that meat to marble like that on grass? And I smile and say, it's the Dexter. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's tremendously delicious and tender and it marbles so well. 
So many talking points. Where absolutely okay? okay. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have to pick a couple because you you guys just went through a whole list. Um, <laughs> one thing I like uh, teaching farmers is not looking at an animal as one dimensional. And this is what I love about the Dexter animal mm -hmm. um, being dual purpose, and you guys recognizing it as a dual purpose, if not tri purpose animal. Um, you know, and I love the crossover, the marketing crossover. Oftentimes, again, I'm, I love pigs, <laughs> so I use a pig example. Uh, you know, when people think about pigs, they think of, oh, pork. Oh, okay, well, that's one way. But what about utilizing the lard for cosmetics, beauty products? So then you are getting a completely different market. People who are interested in skincare and, and feeling good, smelling good, you know, um, and they realize, oh wait, you sell pork too? Oh, yeah. interesting. But see, you're doing that with the Dexter's when it comes to milk production and vice versa. And I think that's something that oftentimes farmers uh, don't capitalize on very well mm -hmm. is being able to make those crossover sales um, with that. And so, so awesome job on that. Um, and uh, let's definitely connect uh, I think there are a couple of like research grant opportunities um, that you guys should definitely um, try to figure out and get on board with. So we can talk off air about that. But uh, yeah, this needs to be studied. Um, yeah. um, you know, so if, if, and this is to anybody, if you have a heritage breed and you're realizing there's something very specifically unique about your breed uh, and you want to figure out what it is that makes that breed unique, your breed unique. Um, there are research opportunities, um, especially like SARE, uh, S-A-R-E, which stands for Sustainable Agriculture and Research and Education. Uh, there are different regions uh, for SARE, and they actually do a lot of funding uh, for projects similar to this. So if you want something like that funded, definitely reach out to SARE, and we can kind of help you out with that. Um, awesome. Anyways, anyways, anyways. Um, so kind of getting back to Dexter, uh, one thing I loved about raising Dexter was the, uh, they were really manageable. Uh, so again, I raised, I was raising Murray Grays um, as well, which are, I think are an Australian breed. Um, not super huge like Angus, but they are a pretty good size. And then we had Dexters and Dexters, it, just easy to move around. I mean, I had some crazy ones, um, but they weren't on our farm. Uh, we brought them in, so that's kind of why. Um, you know, but they were really easy to move, very easy to manage. And what I really love is the price point. Uh, you know, just looking at the size as well, a lot of people aren't going to want to buy a, a big, big Angus, like a whole Angus, you know, but they are very interested in buying small carcass cattle. Uh, so, yeah. can I talk about how small carcass, how you finesse in marketing with small carcass cattle like the Dexter? Yeah, no, no, that's um, I can start, Kimberly, and please jump mm -hmm. in. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that that is a selling point. I, I think of of the breed and what our our breeders and owners actually do. That focus in part on on the beef side is that they are marketing the the Dexter cattle carcass as you don't have to make a choice between a quarter or a half. You you can get every bit of the delicious Dexter beef from from you know, let's say tail the horn, right? Um, and th they don't have to make those choices. You you get you get your your roast, your 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 steaks, and and you get all of it. And you know, typically, a, a generally there, there's very but but you can finish Dexter beef in 18 to 20 months at, to an 800 pound live weight. Uh, and then get a, then yes, and and the 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 slaughterhouses and butchers also appreciate not having to haul up that. 800, 900 pound carcass as well, because you know a, a typical you can get 500 pound live or uh, hanging weights uh, off of those animals, um, and and the portion cuts once you even get to the box beef are then more reasonable as well for health conscious folks that are looking to have some delicious Dexter beef, uh, but their 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 T bone is this size rather than you know rather than this size. Green. Like bigger uh, than your head. Yeah. So, and I don't know about you, but I have a hard time eating that that much steak all at one setting. Uh, so, it, it it goes with the carcass size. It goes all the way from being able to efficiently raise a a, a 
a good sized carcass that's not going to overwhelm you in terms of inputs to get it to that weight, that finish weight. And yeah, because they're incredibly efficient to finish to their weight as long as you have that weight in mind. If, if, if you're trying to get, you know, just a, a per pound carcass, Dexters are not your breed, but I think we're moving away from that as, as, as a society, as a culture, and trying to focus on efficiencies and effectiveness in moving forward. But that translates all the way down into the ultimate, what goes on your plate. It, 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 it's a very reasonable uh, portion size. And, you know, if, if, if you get 300 pounds of beef back uh, per animal, <clears throat> that exactly fills a 15 foot cubic mm -hmm. freezer and you have the whole yep. animal. So, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I, I sell direct to consumer and one of the benefits of having the Dexter cattle is that you can take a whole one and put it in your freezer. You don't have to, as a, as a retailer, I don't have to try to find two people to buy one beef when I slaughter it. I can, I can just find one family, even a family of three or four can take on a whole, a whole animal. It's about equal to about half that of a, of a deck of a grass fed Angus so, or I don't know. I, I only ever bought grass fed before, so I can't um, say how much a grain finished one would be, but um, the other benefit, and I didn't even think this was an issue until I started talking to my customers was when you split an animal in half, they're like, well, am I getting mine back? Well, it's, <laughs> you know, they should be about equally proportionate, but people don't understand that. And so they want to know when they put in their cut order that they're getting exactly like, well, that person didn't get my, some of my steaks. I got all of my steaks. They're getting all of their animal back. Um, and economically, it's, it is a little bit cheaper to buy the whole animal as a Dexter because you're not buying a, a, a 2000 pound live animal. Um, so they, they like that aspect of it. And, um, I like the fact that they're just at that size, they're easier on your pastures. And um, as a homesteader, I I can raise one steer if I just choose to for myself or my family. And I don't have to worry about, you know, eating up a, a huge animal in a year before the meat goes bad. A Dexter fits the bill for your average homesteader that's looking to provide meat for their families. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, so uh, another thing I think is really important is uh, we, we start talking about and this is for people who are, are doing uh, grain or grain finish, you know, feed. If, if I don't know if y'all raise livestock that require feed, you know that during 2019 and even now, feed had the, the prices for feed have just shot up. Shut up. It's almost becoming very uneconomical for people to even raise livestock if they are feed dependent. And so I love how you're up. Jeff, you especially mentioned this, talking about how the Dexter cattle really does have nice forage conversion, but not just that, but it doesn't require a lot of food. It doesn't require a lot. We're not dealing with, you know, show stock Angus, right? You know, that, that just, just, buffed and built on grain or whatever. And we're talking about very economical cattle, um, small in frame, yet that small frame really does allow for people to have uh, more cattle if they want to per, you know, bigger breed. Uh, it also allows them to say they want just two, two, you know, and they have limited acreage. Well, now they can have more cattle with limited acreage compared to, you know, having those bigger breeds. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, no, th those are good points, pork rind. Um, so um, I'm still having a hard time with the pork rind. Got to get that. <laughs> um, uh, no, that that's that's an excellent point, and you bring up a good point there as well. Is that the and we've talked about in this association, and part of our marketing as association is it's somewhat more difficult because the people that choose to own Dexters are incredibly diverse in, in terms of their what they're seeking cattle for and what their ultimate purpose for them is. Because, because our breed has so many diverse markets from beef, dairy, beef and dairy to 
uh, really nice cows. If, if you're into, you know, it, I, I've heard this cow hugging business is really taking off in places. Flexors would be ideal for that. Uh, I'm serious. I mean, people hug Dexters. They never, that's it. There's no other cow that can replace a Dexter. For, forget goat yoga. Yeah. It's cow hugging season now, y'all. Y'all can kick, kick them goats inside. It's all about hugging cows. Yeah. Uh, but our, our, breed is, our breed is diverse, and the people that choose to own Dexters are, are incredibly diverse as well. So we have to market to a, a, a much wider audience than your Angus. We keep mentioning Angus. I mean, they're beef cattle. You market them to beef people for beef. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dexter marketing is much more complex and nuanced than that. And, um, you know, right, Pork Ryan, you mentioned, you know, I just want two animals. You know, that per there are many people that own Dexters that have two animals. Um, many. Uh, and, you know, we were just at our uh, national expo, as Kimberly mentioned, and we saw that, you know, that there were a couple – Farms there that had over a hundred. That's that's an amazing amount of dexters. Mm -hmm. uh, those are not typical dexter herds. Uh, typical dexter herds are anywhere from three or four up to maybe ten or fifteen. That's kind of the maximum or the the the, the modal range of, of of dexter ownership. So um, we're we're a diverse breed. We 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 satisfy many diverse markets. Uh, and all of those are important to us as, as an association and as a breed. Um, and we also have a very strong, uh, you know, pedigree traditional for conservancy purposes as part of our membership as well. So we, we focus on production. We, we focus on conserving the breed as a historical breed as well. Um, Kimberly, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, that's good. Well, I got some things I want to add. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, man, it's it's interesting because, you know, I, I feel like a lot of farmers, we, we understand the issues, we understand why we're raising the breeds that we're raising, how what the cost benefit is for us, but we don't articulate that to our consumers. And I think if we start articulating like, yeah, here's why I'm raising this breed, you know, it, it saves me money to raise this breed, meaning it's going to save you money, you know, in the long run as, as a customer. You know, I'm trying to have a sustainable operation, not just with land management, but also with marketability and business. Because farming is business, um, you know. And so I, I really love the Dexter because it, it, it plays into this kind of like open playing field where you don't have to have 100 acres to play ball. Um, raising cattle, you know, you can have, you know, 15, 20 acres and you're set and you're fine, you know? And so I, I love that because it makes it more inclusive. And nowadays land prices are only going up, 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 up. They're not, they're not going down, you know, unless there's a toxic waste spill or something like that. And at that point, you don't want the land anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so being able to uh, find a breed that allows for, smallholder farmers uh, to have an opportunity to raise beef, even if it's just for the family or even for a market, is super important. So just the inclusiveness of this breed, I think is really marketable and you guys do a great job in uh, getting people to understand that. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add too, I think that there's there's a, a new food movement, for lack of better words, that's happening, that's been going on for a few years now. People have been striving and desiring to know where their food comes from, how it's raised, and 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 just be more involved. And so, as as a you know, commercially speaking and historically for a, for a while now, and and it's and there's many reasons why it's been necessity a necessity, but we've we've can market our animals and our beef and our food industry to be you know, the, the big, big brief breeds make money on volume. And so I, you know, like Jeff and I would never be able to compete or any small Dexter breeder doesn't compete with those larger breeds in the sense that, you know, we're going to have 500 head or a thousand head and sell, you know, to, you know, the meat plants and so on and so forth and make, you know, 10 cents per pound of hoof or something like that. But, 
I, as we can refocus on our animals and not just that they're awesome, but what they have to offer for food and the quality, but then build those relationships with our customers and the people in our communities. And we're feeding families and no, we can't feed the whole nation, but we can be a part of that food revolution and change the way that we raise our animals, the way we market our animals and the way that we reach our consumers. And I don't have to sell anywhere near as many as, um, you know, some of these guys that are, I don't want to pick on them, but do you know what I'm saying? Because my prices are higher because I, I have a smaller market niche and I offer something more unique than they do. And then I build on that relationship with those customers and people love coming out to the farm to see the Dexters and like Jeff said, hug them and pet them. And then, you know, it doesn't seem so scary to say, Hey, you know, I've got five acres. I can have a, a, a Dexter or two and then start providing their own families with healthy nutritionist, you know, food. So I, I, I just, I don't know. I kind of went off a tangent there. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I, you know, I just think that that's one of the niches about Dexter's is that it allows us to be more personable with our, with the consumer. And there's a huge movement of people wanting to come back to that. They don't want to be, you know, can I say this, you know, buying all the, their food at Walmart. They want to know where it's coming from. You know, they want to have that relationship with their, with the people that are, are um, providing their families with food. And I think it's kind of cool, you know, and it allows them to do that in turn. And Dexter's fit that bill. Pre-chat, Kimberly. Pre-chat. Pre-chat. Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, it's, yes. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I, I love how you mentioned competing and you're like we're not we're not we're not going to compete with no. with these big guys, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. Is you got farmers who are like, and I, I, okay, real real quick rant, quick pork run rant. There are a lot of farmers. I see them on Instagram, on Facebook, on social media, on YouTube, and they talk about how well my pork is better than theirs, my beef is better than theirs. My chicken, sheep, goat, whatever, better than theirs. Their stuff is crap and terrible. My stuff is better. And can I just say, if you're that person, have some humility and respect. <laughs> uh, but number two, uh, don't, you're not in the same field. They're in a complete. Right. Have to, to bolster yourself up by tearing other people down. Right. If you do that, that's not going to work. One thing I always tell people, I say a lot of things, but this is one thing, uh, is the best form of marketing is good character. You don't have good character, not just in what you do at home or at work, but what you do on social media, then you're not going to have the best marketing strategy. People respond well to your story, yeah. your experiences, your breed, not yeah you trying to compare yourself to people that don't need to be a part of the conversation. So if you're that person, um, just want to say with love and grace, it's going to be okay. Focus on your story. Focus on your yeah. breed. No one else is not that other farmer down the road. Focus on what you're doing and market that well. You know, otherwise you're really just gassing up the other folks and you don't need to do that. Right. Um, okay, that's Morant. That's Morant. So now I want to talk about processing because you had mentioned that. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, let's talk about this. Because, uh, you know, again, during COVID 19, a lot of people, it's to the point where it's taking them a year, two years, two and a half years to be able to get their animals um, slaughtered and processed. That's a key point. So if you guys are hearing about, these wait lists and stuff like that. Um, the slaughtering, just the, you know, uh, just, you know, um, the slaughtering, not the processing where they're turning into retail cuts, just the slaughtering, that one's more open. So that won't take as long. Um, it's the processing retail cuts 
breaking it down to steaks, um, ground beef, stuff like that, that's really taking a long time. So what a lot of farmers can do, especially if they're just raising for their family, a Dexter cattle, it's, it's not that big. It's, again, it's not like a huge Angus. So if you need to process on farm or you need to go to a USDA facility or county facility and just get it processed there and bring the carcass back and, and butcher it down yourself, it's a, a whole lot easier, a whole lot easier, less manpower to do it. You know, and uh, one thing I... Oh, oh, Ryan, are you still with us? <laughs> I think he's having technical difficulties. He'll be right back. Do you all want to take some questions while we sure. wait for Ryan? Sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's see. We have... Hi, Roy. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. He says, what's up, y'all? Um, Hi, Roy. Looks like Roy's been averaging about a 600 pound carcass. I think he raises Dexter's. That's that. That's a good size Dexter carcass. Mm -hmm. Emily, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good job. But again, but again, we, we're, we're not shooting for maximum size generally as an association. Uh, sure. it, it gets back to Kimberly and pork rinds point of, we're not trying to compete with any other breed in what we're raising for production and either beef or dairy. We're competing with ourselves uh, to make the best possible Dexter uh, beef and dairy that we can within the confines of what the Dexter breed is. That's always yeah. important to state when, and I try to do that every time I'm talking to people about Dexters, understand what our breed is intended to do. And if that meets what you're aiming for, all the better. Absolutely. Yeah, I think as a breeder, it's so important to know the history of Dexters, know what they were, what they originally, not that they don't look different, but I mean, I mean, like they're, what they're supposed to look like, because you do get some anomalies um, or, or confirmation wise, you know, always looking to achieve, you know, good udder structure, because the other thing is these Dexters lifespan is, is 18 to 22 years. And so you think if they can raise 20 calves, that's a lot of calves that they have to nurse. And if they don't have a good udder structure, they can't, uh, they can't sustain a calf and you're going to lose out on their, their longevity. So we just took a couple of questions while you're gone. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you can speak back to Roy, but I'd be interested in, in, in if he has carcass data, we'd love to see it. We love to share carcass data as an associate. Yeah, sure. I think I was mistaken. He raises piney woods in Florida crack. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, all our points still stand. <laughs> That's still a pretty big carcass for a Dexter. Thank you. Thank well, you, Roy. I love sorry that you're that. raising Florida crackers, though, because that was one of the breeds I looked into when I was deciding on Dexters. They sounded very intriguing. I just didn't because. Um, they're so rare, it's hard to find them where I'm at. So hats off to you. So pork rind, do you, everybody's muted. I, no, Brittany's muted. Do you remember what you were saying when you left off? Yeah, uh, yeah I was talking about, yeah, I'm just like, man, technical difficulty, y'all. Um, it's all right. But <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going on a, a, a beautiful rant about how, um, Dexter cattle, because of their small size, makes it for a very good animal that you can break down yourself. Um, oh, a yeah. carcass you can break down yourself. And I think that's yet another selling point. So if you're raising any uh, small frame breeds, you know, uh, being able to have those conversations about that to your clientele is really important. <clears throat> One thing I was mentioning is, you know, being able to, to uh, market your animal in a way that's engaging the community is by holding uh, demonstration classes. So if you know how to break down a uh, half, half or whole uh, animal, in this case a Dexter, then do a demo class on your farm and show people, hey, you can do this yourself. 
Um, or hey, like if you just want to watch me break down meat, you can you can pay for that. They will pay good money. There are friends that I have that are uh, charging two hundred dollars a head. Some do a family two hundred for family, and I've heard that's up upwards to four hundred. These are for small time folks, not big big people with a lot of land or a lot of acreage or a lot of animals. These are people who've got small compact acreage. Um, that are being able to make big bucks just by doing entertainment and value added on their farm through carcass breakdown. So again, much easier to have that conversation when you're talking about uh, a smaller framed uh, cattle like the Dexter compared to breaking down this huge behemoth uh, like some of these bigger breeds. Absolutely. And I think that's a valued um, asset, especially more so nowadays, because of, like I said, that that food movement of knowing where your food's coming from, there's a lot more people wanting to get back to the the farm, so to speak, a quote unquote farm, um, and have their own animals. And then, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, and then, you know, being able to do it themselves. Um, so, you know, having to, just being able to cut that middleman. And then when COVID hit and the food scarcities, it just thrusted people more into wanting to be able to be more self-sufficient in in their food and have that sense of security. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And teaching people how to do the thing that you're doing, not yeah. only adds food security for another family, but it adds security to your wallet because then they're going to be like, oh, so who should I get my cattle from? Yeah. Ooh, who should I be getting my breathing stock from? Hmm. Yeah. Think, think, big, big brain, big brain thinking right here. Big brain thinking. A lot of times, and I hear this from farmers. And if you're this kind of farmer, I just want to just have a have a have a quick talk with you, real quick. You know, uh, don't be afraid of competition. If Absolutely. you again, farming is a business. That's the last thing you should be afraid of is competition. You should be looking at competition. You know what? I'm gonna beat that. But the way to do it is not by making enemies. It's not by shutting off. It's not by isolating. It's by saying, I'm going to work with as many good hearted people as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Right. And so by doing that, you know, uh, teaching people how to break down their own uh, Dexter cattle, uh, they're more interested now in maybe raising it themselves. And even if you don't got the stock, you can say, you know, what? I'll, have, I'll have stock, breeding stock. But I'll tell you the farmer that I get my stock from. So then yeah. if you're not doing breeding, you're helping another breeder out, right? Yep. That's allowing their operation to be more sustainable. So it, it's not trickle down economics, you know, and this is real, this is real community, real marketing, organic marketing, where collaboration, the spirit mm -hmm. of collaboration is what really is going to make you a successful farmer and breeder operation. So yep. those, and it, those are my thoughts. And it builds community. I mean, I, a perfect example that leads into that is, you know, I, I have my own farm where we sell our milk and meat and cheese and eggs and blah, blah, blah. But I do take that, the, um, the tallow from our beef and render it down and make soap and sell that on my farm. So, um, I, but I, and I get tons of people that call me all the time about beef and I'm again, a small breeder. So I send all of those extra people to the lady I used to buy beef from is up the road from me. And I always tell her she's got great beef and she does. And so in turn, as I'm talking her up, if she doesn't have enough beef, she sends them my way or she will process some of her steers and they're all grass fed. And she calls me and she's like, Kimberly, I've got 50 pounds of fat. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course I want it. You know, I mean, I can turn around and sell that, make it a product into I, that's sellable. And so it builds that community and we're, we're building each other up. And she doesn't raise Dexter's perhaps one day I'll, I'll get her to switch, but <laughs> for now, you know, we, we are a team. We're out there to, you know, to, to, we can work together in that sense without tearing each other down for sure. Amen. Jeff, do you got, do you have any comments? Well, yeah, it, it's definitely building a community and the Dexter 
people that own Dexter's are certainly a community. Uh, it is a very, it's a small, as you know, niche breed. Uh, and even though our numbers have grown tremendously over the last 20 years, the Dexter community is still a ver very much like a family, very tightly knit. Um, and it doesn't take long to be in the Dexter breed until you know many, many, a great percentage of all people that own Dexter's. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more with you, Pork Ryan, that, that building people up is a much better way of improving your market standing and share than tearing people down. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Again, the best marketing strategy is good character. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, and, and I, love, I also love this, Kimberly. Your uh, farmer friend doesn't raise Dexters, but you still want to collaborate with her. And, uh, you know, so many people get into this them side, this side versus my side or, oh, well, they're not doing what I'm doing. So, you know, I'm not they are not raising what I'm raising. So I'm just not going to you know, work with them. But instead say, you know what, as long as we have the same standards of production, which are very important. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if you're uh, trying to maintain that standard in your value added products like your soaps, you know, um, that's all that really matters. Can you, uh, can you meet people on principles rather than qualifying identities, right? Mm -hmm. Principles are going to keep people together more than, you know, whether or not you and I look alike, you know, that's not going to really work. Not as good as principles themselves. So again, you know, I'm learning as I mature in this space, as mature as a former educator, that um, oftentimes a lot of the marketing issues that we have aren't really marketing issues. They're issues that go far deeper into our, our humanity and our pride. Um, and being able to understand the human piece, our human piece in our marketing strategy, or lack thereof, I think it's really going to make a big difference when we are trying to work or trying to expand our markets and expand our business. And the best way of doing that is by expanding your community because you shouldn't yeah. be doing this alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brittany, we got any questions? I, 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 I thought y'all answered a couple. I don't know if you had any more. We do have a couple more. Let's see. Um, Hi, Jean. Glad you're joining us today. Hi, Kirk. Thanks for joining us today. Kirk says, I DNA tested a bunch of Dexters for beef tenderness and marbling, and they average better DNA scores than most other breeds, including Ingus. I sell whole Dexter cows to customers for beef. Size is perfect. I like the thickly, thickly cut beef steaks for better cooking. The thickly <laughs> cut Dexter steak is the perfect amount of beef. Thank you for yes. that wonderful testimony. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Love thank, that you, Kirk. Beef. thank you, Kirk. <laughs> Man, he, he got a big old, big old boy. Look at that. Look at yeah. That. yeah. Ooh, hefty. That thing is hefty. <laughs> Hi, Rudy. Thanks for joining us today. Rudy says, as a first time Dexter owner, what's good to start with? A trio? That's an excellent question that comes up a lot from new owners. Um, and I don't think there's any one right answer. I, I think it really depends upon their situation, your situation, Rudy. Uh, the first thing that I always tell people when that question comes up is you have to remember cattle are herd animals. Uh, so you do not generally want a single animal. That's not good for them. And you really won't get the full experience from having cattle from having a single animal. Um, one way to go is if you're very, very new to livestock in general and then, and then cattle in particular is to get a couple steers perhaps uh, and finish them out and, and see how you like that process. That's because there, there's a time limit on, on, on there's an expiration date on those boys. So you're, you're, you're going to know uh, you can learn as you go along and, and know you're not committed long term if it doesn't work out. So that's a really good way to go. Uh, a trio, I'm assuming you're talking about maybe a couple bred cows or, or a couple cows and a bull. That is, in fact, how we started our Dexter cattles many, many years ago. We bought two heifers and a bull, and away we went. Uh, so that is also a good way to go. Uh, and on this topic, just in, in terms of when you're researching you know, what you want to do, I always encourage people, do your research. Research the breed as much as you possibly can. 
know what they're there for, know, know their purpose. Uh, so you're not disappointed when you finally do get your animals. And then also research as many uh, purchase opportunities as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. the, the first time that someone offers you a Dexter at, at, at whatever price, it may be a great offer, but it's generally not best to take your, the first offer. That, that I, I've seen too many people, particularly when Dexters were even less uh, common than they are now, uh, just feel the need to take, oh, I've, I've got to get that, it's available. Do your research, research everything, research the animals you want, research what your intention is for, for your herd, research to the extent you can, the particular person that's offering you an animal. It's very important to know, you have to develop, a, in, particularly with small niche breeds, you wanna develop a relationship between you as a purchaser and, and the person you're buying from. That's an incredibly important, particularly if you're new to cattle, they can become an incredible mentor and resource for you to rely upon. Mm -hmm as you move forward. Yep. And one thing I was going to add and that I learned, um, you know, you're all, everybody makes mistakes. They just do. Um, but if I, if I've come to a point now where I, I feel like I've, I've run out of time. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't want to start. I, and no, there's nothing wrong with starting with young heifers. There certainly isn't. But I think that, um, for me, it, it's more important I, now to start with some mature cows, at least one, because one there, you know, you, you literally get what you see. See what you see, what you get. Does that make sense? So, you know how she's going to turn out, you know, she's a good mother, you know, if she's got a good udder structure, you know, if she's got good depth and you know, if she, you know what I mean? And then you can have that that steer or that maybe she's bred and you've got a calf that's coming. Um, but then, you know, she'll be your matriarch. And especially if you're new to cattle, um, she kind of will teach the young ones proper manners and how to behave around them. One of the biggest mistakes we are at least new to cattle people make, Jeff probably never did that, but is, is to treat them like a pet and expect them to behave like a dog. <laughs> Why do we do this? They're cows, but we think like this. Why doesn't it love me? Why won't it let me pet it? It was halter trained. It was social with them. It's a cow. Give her time. <laughs> Just take a relaxation, you know, sit out there and be with them. But, you know, if, whatever you start with, it is like he said, research it and make sure that you're, you're buying what you want and not what you think you have to have right at this very moment and be patient um, and never ever buy anything sight unseen ever. I don't care how many pictures you get, <laughs> visit that animal. <laughs> Preach it, Jeff and Kimberly. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know, see, here's how I know you guys are experts and are, are the real deal is because when Jeff was talking, like I saw this question, I was like, I know exactly what I'm going to say. And then Jeff just said it all. That's exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, if I said oh, it I'm all. Back. I'm 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 back. Uh, no, but what I was saying is, you know, that's the exact same advice I'd give to someone who's getting pigs, you know, is, is hey, before you even start with breeding stock, a lot of people just out the gate won't breeding stock. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. You need to, especially if you're, uh, this is more so if you've never raised uh, that species before, especially that breed before. You know, start with your, your, your in this case, not since these are, these are cows, not pigs, uh, your steers. Um, you yeah. Know, because you're going to, you're going to see, you're going to make all your mistakes with your mm -hmm. two steers. You know, and it's going to be okay. It's a learning experience. You're going to learn how cattle works with your land, which is really important before you get a big herd or, or start breeding. And so, yeah, it's so, so important to start very low scale. Don't go super hard, fast, quick um, when you're getting into this. Take your time. Again, our heritage breeds, it's all about going with the flow, going slow, taking everything in. But one thing about Kimberly's point, this is what I love about Kimberly, she mentioned what I call the farmer's eye. It's not just feed, it's not just water and shelter, right? 
It's the context in between all of those things. It's actually sitting out on your pasture mm-hmm. and just sitting there and watching your animals. Yeah. I can watch pigs for hours and not get bored. They can be eating, <laughs> rooting. They can be taking a nap. And it's just like, it's just like television to me. I don't get bored of it. And that's how you yeah. know when you're really connected to that breed or that species is when you just are just so amazed, so enthralled by the animal that you could spend the whole day just watching it and not yeah. get bored and be completely satisfied and content in your soul. Yep. Oh, yeah. Anytime not I'm having a bad day, I just go, okay, that's it. I put everything away and I go sit out there and I pet my Dexters. <laughs> It's like they just make everything all better. <laughs> what were you about to say, Jeff? I was going to say, now you're preaching, Ryan, and, and I'm extending an invitation to you to the 2022 American Dexter Expo in Worcester, Ohio, next next June. Please, we'd love to have you. Right, Kimberly? Yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, wow. that, 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 I've never had that happen before where someone's like, all right, you're invited, dude. You, 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 you've proven yourself. You didn't know that we were betting you this entire time, and, and now you're you're legit. Wow, I I feel so honored. Like, <laughs> give me just one minute. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh man. All right. Just right. day. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm, done geeking out. I'm done geeking out. Um, actually, I'm gonna geek out after all this is done. Um, but wow, thank. Thank y'all. I appreciate it. But let's connect afterwards. Um, ah, yeah. Oh, next question, Brittany, for us. All right. right. Sure. Yes. Um, let's see. Roy, thank you for this tip. It says, take your time. I went from six to 64. I never Ooh. thought I'd say I have too many, but I do. <laughs> it's great advice. <laughs> well, Jeff, how many times we heard that Dexters are like potato chips? You can't just have one, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Let's see. I think we've got a couple others. Kirk says we sell dexters to hunters who get who didn't get their elk or deer. They come to our farm and we help them quickly and humanely slaughter an animal and they take the carcass and self process. So I think that's going back to your uh, processing talk earlier, which is very smart. Um, let's see. And I think that's all of our questions. Great. Great. These are good questions. Y'all, I, man, I just, I had fun. I mean, I always try to have fun, but like I had fun. I know um, uh, Jeff had sent a, a little private message to us. And he was like, guys, I know I had some meetings, but uh, I just told him I'm going to be late. <laughs> He, he, y'all, he was gonna leave. Uh, he was gonna leave thirty minutes into it, and he just said, "I'm having way too much fun. I'm gonna tell him I'm gonna be late." I, wow! That <laughs> I just my heart. So we we'll be glad to have the American Livestock Breed Conservancy. We we would love to partner with you as an association because there's so much that we can partner further that that we can learn and and do together for our breed and and, and for the ALBC. Um, and Brittany, you as well, I, I think that I don't have the exact dates, but it's like the third week in June, just block it off in your calendar. Cause you're coming to Worcester. I think. I would love to you. That's so fun. I'm excited. I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You, you, you would, we, we'd love to have you, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and hearing what you, you were saying, Bork Ryan. Would, would be so beneficial because many people that show up at the, at the expo, the national uh, convening of our association, are new to cattle. They're, many of them are new to any livestock. Some of them are experienced in different ways, but we'd love to have someone other than uh, people like Kimberly and I say all that you've said. Well, Absolutely. Perfect. I'd be honored. Well, we're going to hold you to it. <laughs> no. hey, please do. Please, please do. I am mad. I think you'd be a great speaker. Yeah, you know, my, my passion has always been I want to help farmers. And I thought that by doing that, being in this field, that I needed to teach them about 
um, you know, methods of production, because I've raised just about every edible livestock breed. Um, but what I realized over time was that it wasn't the production methods, it wasn't even the marketing methods, but it was really teaching people about good character and critical thinking. And if you have good character and you develop critical thinking, you can literally do anything, just about. Maybe even go to Mars. I don't know. We can get Dexter to Mars one day. <laughs> hey, let's make, that, let's make that like a 2050 goal. How about that? Yeah, um, you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be the Dexter that jumps over the moon, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no whole scenes around here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Brittany, let's, uh, let's get into closing, uh, our, our formal closing process, and then we can uh, kind of keep going. Absolutely. So this is our shameless marketing plug. Our, so if there's anything that you would like to plug, I've got your uh, website queued up here for the American Cat Dexter Cattle Association, and that's dextercattle.org. So please go there, learn more about the association, learn more about Jeff and Kimberly and what they do. Um, and quick, quick, quick plug on this website. Y'all... Bree Association Manager of Livestock Conservancy here. Y'all, um, go to their website. If, you, if you're a breed association or you're a part of one, go to their website, look at their website, and be in awe at how well put together that website is. I mean, I, again, I geek out with marketing stuff. So like I went on the website and I was like, they got graphics. Moving graphics, you know, <laughs> when you go down, they got good color palette. They actually have like a color scheme, you know, uh, pictures look up to date. The website didn't look like it was made in like the early 2000s, you know, yeah. like it, that is, you know, that is part of marketing. It's not just for breed associations. If you are a farmer and you consider your farm a business, which because farming is business. You know, you need to make sure that you have a good looking website. You can go to places like Wix and they can either make one for you or you can doodle and dabble and make one for yourself. It's really easy and simple to do. Um, I don't recommend WordPress starting out, just FYI. <laughs> um, it's hard. <laughs> Unless you have a coding background, and even then it's still hard. You know, but start developing that website because that really is going to allow for people to come to your farm via the internet. Right, you need to be able to be found on the internet. Facebook's great and all, but you don't own Facebook. Facebook owns your information, not you, but your information. Um, you know, and so if they say, "Hey, you know, we don't care about this breed anymore, or we don't care about farms anymore," they can shut you down, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to have your own domain, your own website. And when you make your own website, make it look pretty. Ask families and friends, not uh, maybe ask people from the younger generation a little bit who are more technologically savvy and see how their experience going on your website is. Ask your customers, hey, what, would I, what should I add to my website? What would be some things that you'd be interested in seeing on my website? You know, and find people who can help you if you're technical, technologically dysfunctional. Again, it's about bringing people into community. I'm pretty sure you know somebody in your family, in your clientele, customer base, who can help you, right? Even if it's just like pro bono, volunteer work, they'll do it because they believe in you, they believe in the vision of your farm, and they believe in your breed. People will literally help you if you ask. But the thing is, you have to ask for help, right? This is setting aside that pride and saying, you know what? I don't know everything. I'm not able to do everything. But the cool thing is, I can ask people for help and they can help me achieve my goals. And in reality, you're helping them live in the things that they love to do. Um, that's building relationship, that's building partnership. It's not just a, a transactional kind of thing going on, but now you actually are building community. Again, it's not just about operation practices, not just about marketing strategy. It's about having good character and using critical thinking skills. I'll be able to, to build community. 
All right, I'm done yep. with that plug. Anyways, go check out their, their website. It's amazing. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. It was a long process to get that going. And it's always a work in progress. With any website, you're always ch changing it, tweaking it, updating it. And one thing I want to plug in is that on your website, you always have to have an About Us page. Always. Because people want to know you. So do not leave that off your website. That will be a make or break thing for your success. Okay? Absolutely. Perfect. And if you are also on Facebook, you can look them up at American Dexter Caddo. Is there anything else y'all want to plug? No, I uh, please visit both those. Uh, there's tons of information in there. Thank you, Ryan, or Pork Ryan, for the the, uh, the, the plug for our, our website. Um, it, it was a, a long-term process because prior to that one, ours did look like it was made in 2000. Because in fact, it was. Um, <laughs> so anyone anyone can do it. But it does take some effort and commitment and resources from the association committed to it. Uh, and Kimberly has, has been a big part of helping us get that ADCA website to where it is. So thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, and it, it, it's always a work in progress. Go there uh, and please reach out to anyone you see on the ADCA website. Ask, ask the questions that have been asked here. Feel free to call Kimberly or myself. Uh, we're glad to help you uh, learn more about Dexter cattle. They're a absolutely fantastic breed to own and live with. Uh, as we have for almost a quarter of a century, and it's just, they're great cattle. Yeah. Worcester, Ohio, third week in June. 2022, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Woo and, right. and, and definitely let's follow up. Uh, Mark Ryan, you were mentioning about research opportunities. We really need to follow up with you on that. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I got Thank some farms. Having. I was going to say, I got some farmers in Ohio that have been just itching to have me come up there. Now I got an excuse, thanks to y'all. Hey. Um, so yeah, um, Brittany, let's do our let's do our shameless plug because um, that's, that's really great. important. Yes. Um, <laughs> you go ahead and I'll finish off for you. All right, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody that posted comments and questions today. We appreciate you. Thanks for being an engaged audience today. That's awesome. And a big thank you to all of our members who make programs like Marketing Monday possible. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you're not a member and you want to become a member, we'd love to hook you up with that. And I think Ryan has an awesome speech. <laughs> uh, guys, 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 guys. And ladies, 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 ladies. Peoples, peoples. Um, so at the Livestock Conservancy, we have a plethora of different memberships. Uh, but one I'd love to always recommend is the Conservation Champion membership. I myself am a Conservation Champion, and the way that that works is you donate as low as four, not the street, four dollars a month. Four dollars a month. And over time, that equals a, a full on membership. You get the full on membership as you, uh, when you sign up for it. Uh, easy, four dollars a month. It's just automatically out of your account. And you don't have to think about, like, did I renew this year? I can't remember if I did or not. We get so many emails with people asking that or not knowing. They're like, well, why wasn't I on this? Or how did I not get this? And like, hey, you can renew. But we can renew you now. And with the Conservation Champion uh, membership, that's just the most easiest, basic way of doing that. Again, four bucks a month. Cheaper than a cup of Starbucks, right? right. I don't even like coffee, but like it's cheaper than, than a cup of Starbucks. Um, so definitely consider being a conservation champion. This doesn't just help the livestock conservancy as an organization. This helps the breeds that we are working towards conserving. This helps the farmers that we are working with towards conservation of these heritage and, rare, and, uh, and rare breeds. Rare breeds that you're raising yourself. So with that, um, we enjoyed having y'all here. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Jeff, for being yes. here. Um, y'all were a godsend, a blessing, and uh, mm -hmm. look forward to seeing you in Ohio. In I do too. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to 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 uh, give us plug on Dexter's and to share with the community. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, everyone. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week for Horse Month. Get excited. Yay. Woo! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <All right. laughs>